Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell I'm going to tell you a quick story, and I'm going to sing you a song, and then I'm going to introduce the actual person who's supposed to be standing up here tonight, my good friend, I think, um, Buddy McBride. And so, um, my, for you folks out in uh, virtual land, I'm, my name is John Bear Mitchell, and I'm here to uh, open for Bunny. So. Any complaints can be emailed to the house, and uh, I'm sure they'll take care of them in that fire pit out there. So uh, long ago, we had a person I want to introduce you to. His name is Gluska, or Gluskabe, as the Penobscot used to call him. And it means that they, he knows everything. He's also the balance of knowledge with the feminine and the masculine. And uh, that balance of knowledge is truth, which is implied in his name. And also implied in his name is he came from nothing. He created himself. And he was here to learn from the animals. And he was adopted into a family where he was taught. And now he showed every emotion that anybody as a human shows, but he was showing those emotions exacerbated a thousand times over, his joy, his happiness, his sadness, his anger, everything he felt as a human for emotions was put out there tenfold. You always knew where he was at, couldn't hide himself. But he was also kind of uh, lazy at times. And again, remember, exacerbated many times over. When he was lazy, he was very lazy. I, I would say like a teenager. And uh, well, anyway, one day he wanted to uh, create this magic game bag. If you don't know what a game bag is, it's basically a bag you carry your hunt home in. And so you would just uh, go out and, and do your hunt and bring your, your meat back in this bag and anything else you needed to. And you leave the rest out to nature for nature to use give it back to the earth, give it back to the other animals you'd share. And he heard that he could create a, a magic game bag out of fur, but it had to be fur from some other special creature that roamed the forest. So he told his grandmother who adopted him, the woodchuck, you know, the groundhog, she adopted him. She was gonna teach him everything that he needed to know. What better person to do that than a grandmother? She took him in. And uh, when he was asking her about the game bag, she said, okay, I'll go to the South. And so she went to the South and she wanted to gather some fur from an animal from the South. So she went down to the South and she looked for an animal. She couldn't find any animal that had fur that was unusual. She did find one animal that was scaly, but no fur. So she decided that there was a special rabbit down there she was gonna ask for fur and she asked. And this rabbit gave up some fur, said, I shed this fur all the time, take what you want. She did. She went home and she integrally rove this game bag. Beautiful, not very large, but a beautiful game bag. And Gluskab when presented with it was just amazed. Grandmother, this is beautiful, but it's not magical. She said, okay. So she went into the West where she discovered this animal that we didn't have that's called they call it the coyote in english took some fur from that and intricately wove this game bag and again it was not magical and gluska was upset that she went through all this work so she said i'll go to the north and she found up there wabe and muin we called it the white bear and she got some fur from that surely this must be magical nope she spent many times, many, many days on this, it was not magical. So she was sad. She sat there, went to every direction, she said. She was just disappointed with herself that she couldn't create this magical game bag. And while she was sitting there, she looked down at her own belly and she said, you know what? I'm gonna make a game bag out of the fur from my belly. So she plucked it all off. If you ever look at a groundhog to this day, they don't have hair on their belly. But she wove a game bag from her belly hair and 
surely it was very, very tiny. Gluskab held it. It was very small. But it was, it was magical. It was the one. So he went out into the woods and he told the animals. He said, the, um, the, the, the sun is going to crash into the earth. You, must, you all must hide in my, in my game bag. And they looked and they said, you got to be kidding me. That's so small. How are we going to fit in there? Well, when they went to look, they realized that even though the bag was small, it was magical. There was another world the size of the forest that they knew inside that game bag. So they started jumping in to protect themselves from the sun crashing to the earth. And Gluska went home and he was proud. He showed his grandmother. He said, look, I have all these animals trapped in here. Whenever we're hungry, we could just reach in and get some animals. She said, Gluskab, you can't do that. That's greedy. That's not something that we want to do. Those animals will become very sick and they'll die. They'll starve and we'll be eating sick animals. And plus we need to share. The abundance of the forest is not just for us. And these animals need to live a healthy life. They need to reproduce. You must return them. And he didn't want to do it because he knew it'd get caught. So he, he made up another lie. I, I, saved, I saved the earth. I pushed the sun away. You can come out now. And they all jumped out and they thanked him for his good deed. And that's the story of Gluskub in the game bag. And that teaches us a lot. That teaches us a lot in terms of how we need to hold ourselves. I'll leave it at that. And with that, I'm going to sing you a song that might sound ancient. And it kind of is because it's an ancient language and an ancient chant, but it's a newly created song. It's called Mui. <clears throat>
zel mulcha bitax. Ne guaske tamek bez cheptule in pizun mejuagan gabi won wale won hey. And that song just thanks all the directions for bringing us medicine, life, food, water, and happiness. And I thanked all those directions, including the creator and the earth. And I won't interpret every word, but I hope you felt the song. And with that, I want to introduce my friend and uh, author, curator, Bunny McBride, who has done great service to Wabanaki education, at least in my perspective, and other people's that work in education as well. When I was a middle school teacher, social studies, your favorite subject, you all have great memories. I, um, Bunny had just come out with a book called The Women of the Dawn. And I loved the theme and the passion and the fact that a woman who I knew growing up, her story was finally completed. And I've been using that book since then, over 20 years in teaching at the college level now. And other books that her, her, uh, I guess um, that she and her and, and Harold have written together, collaboratively. She's done such great service for us, and really brought humanity, humility, and real life to our people. And I'm sure you're going to get that tonight when you hear her speak. I could go through her list of accolades, but I just wanna say that she's a beautiful person and uh, she has a gift and you're gonna hear some of that tonight. So with that, I would like to introduce Bunny McBride. Thank you. Well, actually after that, I think we can all just go home. Um, I really was, really was hoping John Bear could be here tonight because I knew he would drum us back in time and that he would bring a spirit to the stories of the women that I'm going to tell you about tonight. So I feel like I'm in a collaboration with five Wabanaki people actually tonight with John Bear and then the, the women that I'm going to tell you about. And of course, we're all here initially because of this ship that we can, those of us who are here live can see outside the window. And I really love the juxtaposition of that ship out there and this first image on the screen. And because of course, before the Virginia, there was the birch bark canoe and the, um, the native craft that was so fundamental to Wabanaki way of life um, long before the Europeans arrived. I mean, swift, light and portable, Birch bark canoes were really the centerpiece of Wabanaki survival. With these boats, they traveled the rivers, the streams, the lakes, um, their liquid highways. They stood in them to hunt porpoise and to spear salmon. They used them to transport furs and other trade goods and to carry their supplies and their game bags um, that John told you about tonight um, between their home villages, their home village and their seasonal campsites. When on the, when on the move, Oh, I can show you some more pictures. 
when on the move, they could sleep under them on a rainy night. Um, one of the four women I'll tell you about tonight claimed that she was born in a canoe. And as I say that, I'm thinking that probably some others were conceived in a canoe, not unlike the backseat of a Ford and a Subaru. Um, so, so I will now move on to the, my talk moving from the, the ship to, hi, Aaliyah, this is John Bear's granddaughter. Uh, my husband, Harold, and I, we live on a small peninsula just upriver from here. Um, very often, especially on misty days, um, we look out and we imagine the first humans who lived here. We picture them paddling the Kennebec in birch bark canoes or trudging the frozen back on snowshoes. Um, sometimes I envision their names rising up from the mist. And you see some of those names here, Skidwaras, Pityaninsky, Rawandagan, Marie Agat. For us, this kind of imagining comes from four decades, more than four decades of work on an array of projects with the Wabanaki peoples. By now, all of you who have been watching, listening to this series know that Wabanaki means Dawnland and that it's the overarching name for the Abenaki, the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddy and the Penobscot. And it's the word that led to the title of this book that I was asked to talk to you about tonight women of the dawn. So this book tells the story of four Wabanaki Indian women, all named Molly, and told through the voice of the one who lived most recently. That's Molly Spotted Elk, who was born in the early 20th century. And um, through her daughter and her sister, I had permission to channel Molly's voice, um, which I was able to do because I'd written a full um, length biography of Molly Spotted Elk and also had all of her diaries and all of her love letters and all of her the research that she herself had done and had interviewed really scores of people about her. Um, so Molly is not a uh, an indigenous name. It is it is really the result of baptism. It's the Indian pronunciation of Marie or Mary, which were the most uh, common baptismal names during the colonial era. So combined, their stories span four, span four, um, four centuries, and each story is tied to a season, um, which really echoes what I think of as a very common theme in the colonial experience. It's that movement from innocence to shrewdness, to bitterness, and then finally into renewal. The first story begins on the eve of Wabanaki demise in the 1600s. The last ends at the dawn of the cultural revitalization in the latter 1900s. Probably most of you know that from the moment Champlain steered his French pinnace into the mouth of the Kennebec in 1605, two years before the short-lived Popham colony began, this river turned into a flow of contention. For more than 150 years, competing groups of men, especially the English and the French, strove to gain um, and maintain control over the Kennebec and other vital riverine arteries in Northeast America. Fishers, trappers, and loggers, followed by merchants, missionaries, and mercenaries, traveled these waterways in pursuit of souls and wealth and power. By the time these intruders arrived, Wabanaki peoples had been flying the network of streams, lakes, and rivers, and coastal waters for at least 10,000 years. The changes and the losses that outsiders threw upon the indigenous communities were absolutely seismic. In the early 1600s, even before the settlers arrived and foreign powers began warring over Wabanaki lands, exposure to foreign diseases, from seasonal fishers and traders claimed the lives of 75 to 90% of the region's coastal people. I mean, just imagine in your circle, losing 75 to 90% of your people, all, everything that you rely upon falls apart. That travesty is known as the great dying. And that brings us to the first Molly 
in the 17th century. Her story falls under the heading of late summer, known to her people as the moon of ripening berries. It begins with an epigraph, as do all the others as well. And this is it. I'll be reading um, some passages, so here's one of them. The moon of ripening berries waned, and its fruits fell to the ground, or hung on stems like drops of blood. Death seemed to be everywhere, yet in the fruit were seeds. So Molly Matilda was her baptismal name. Her native name was Pityaniski. She entered the world around 1665, and that was just, just before her people, the survivors of the epidemics, um, began experiencing the devastating effects of colonial warfare and displacement. She was born in the Penobscot Bay area, where her father, Matakawando, was a tribal chief for Sakam. When she was a girl, her father established a really close relationship with the French military garrison at Pentagoic, present day uh, Castine, which was just around the coastal corner from his in summer encampment. There, he traded beaver and other furs for guns and ammunition, steel axes, copper kettles, and other valuables. With keen acumen, he built, he really built strategic relationships and his wealth and his prominence grew. By the mid 1670s, he was recognized as a grand chief by Wabanaki allies from Machias down to the Kennebec. Here's a passage from Molly's Matilda's chapter that offers a glimpse of her early childhood when she was still known as Pityaniski. Throughout winter's reign, Pityaniski's life centered on the hearth in her family's large birch bark wigwam. Glowing embers filled the air with quivering light and heightened the sweet scent of the hemlock boughs that carpeted the ground. Sitting upon fur blankets, her mother nursed the youngest child and showed Pityaniski how to mend clothes and embroider them with dyed moose hair or porcupine quills. <clears throat> her father, crouched on his heels by the fire, roasted chunks of meat or repaired his weapons. After nightfall, as Pityaniski and her siblings nodded off, the age-old murmur of singing or storyteller, stellate telling, danced about the shelter. It mingled with smoke from the fire and tobacco pipes and drifted out into the frigid darkness through an opening in the peak of the wigwam. Pityaniski's grandmother told one particular story more often than any other. She always began the tale the same way, just as her own grandmother had told her. Long ago, just after the geese had flown north, the old ones saw something odd on the horizon of the big water. At first, they thought it was a floating island or a great white bird, but soon they realized it was the fulfillment of an ancient foretelling that bearded strangers would come to Wabanaki country in great sailing boats from the direction of the rising sky fire. In, in 1674, Pityaniski's father suffered a great blow when Dutch privateers attacked and sacked the French port at, at Pentagoet. Two years later, the first of six Anglo-Wabanaki wars began. It was triggered by a Wampanoag uprising in Massachusetts and quickly escalated throughout Southern New England and then on up into Maine. Here, it deepened and strengthened the relationship among Wabanaki and their French allies, who really compared to the English, um, the French were fairer in trade and far less aggressive in approaching and in appropriating and settling Wabanaki lands. Matakawando gained a lifeline for his nation through Pityaniski's baptism as Molly Matilda and, to her marriage of her, and through her marriage to a young French officer, Jean-Vincent d'Abadie, the second Baron of saint castin Having survived the Dutch raid on Pentagoet, Castin, Castin had set up a fur trade business not too far from the ruins of the fort and just downriver from Matakawando's summer encampment. Molly's Matilda's marriage was one of political alliance. Yet it appears to have become much more than that 
because of San Castan's clear commitment to her, her people, his ease with their life ways, her father's trust in him, the benefits he provided in matters of trade and protection, and of course, his role as father to their mixed blood children growing up in the dangerous middle ground between indigenous and colonial America. Here are two paragraphs that describe the perils that Molly Matilda and her children faced and how she tried to keep them safe. Whenever warfare threatened life at Penobscot Bay, Molly Matilda and her children retreated 35 miles inland to an ancient Wabanaki campground on an island in the Penobscot River. Now known as Indian Island, this safe haven also became a retreat for a French missionary priest named Pierre Turi. Turi was frustrated by colonial conflicts near the coast, as well as by coastal fishers and traders who sold alcohol to his Indian flock. He liked the idea of the island as a more remote site for his mission work. So, after securing official papal permission to settle there and build a chapel, the priest moved in. He saw special religious promise in Mali and San Castan's mixed blood children and pressed the couple to send them to a Catholic school in Quebec. Molly Matilda did not like the idea. Quebec was a world apart, a place where bodies of water met bodies of thought, sometimes colliding and creating great waves. Young people, even adults, could be swept away in that city and never find their way home. This frightened Molly, but she did not resist the wishes of the priest and her husband. With sorrow in her heart, she let her children go one by one. In 1701, her youngest son, Jean-Pierre, left for school just as his older siblings had done. Only nine years old when he arrived in Quebec, he spoke almost no French, and he barely had time to learn the language. Within a year, he became ill and died. To lose a child in her arms would have been difficult, but to have her son die in the care of strangers in a faraway place was unbearable. On hearing of his death, Molly Matilda fled into the woods. She ran blindly and without pause until the pounding of her heart filled the forest. Exhausted, she sat down among the pines and began to trace back in her mind the brief life of her boy. Coming to that time when she had carried him safely within her body, she wept. As afternoon shadows merged into night, Molly built a fire. In time, she pulled a burning stick from the blaze and snuffed its flame in a bed of sweet fern. She stroked the charred stick with her palm and smeared her face black with soot. Then, folding her hands and closing her eyes, she prayed for her child's soul. Midway through her prayer, she shivered. Where is he? She wondered. Had he joined the spirit world of her Wabanaki parents, or was he in a Christian heaven? With unspeakable dismay, she realized she did not know. Despite Molly Matilda's father's leadership skills in frontier warfare and diplomacy, and her husband's cunning in conflict and commerce, Molly Matilda's life was just fraught with uncertainty, violence, and loss. She lived through two more Anglo-Wabanaki wars, and during one of them, one of her daughters was taken hostage. She suffered that loss alone because her husband, Saint Castin, had returned to France to defend himself against a rival's accusation that he had traded with the English enemy. He also went back to France to claim his ancestral estate in Bern, southwest of Paris, as security for his family. But alas, he died before making it back to them. There is no record of Molly Matilda's death, but it's said that she is buried on hallowed ground on Indian Island, the heart of the Penobscot Reservation.
in Old Town. This is the next Molly, uh, Molly Ockett. She lived from 1740 to 1816, and her story is linked to the moon of freezing rivers. It begins like this. Late each autumn in Wabanaki country, leaves rattled in the wind while ice glazed the rivers and numbed life. Beneath the freezing sheets, creatures languished. Fish hung in the water like driftwood. Worms burrowed in the silt among dragonfly larvae and snakes coiled in the banks for the long sleep. This was the moon of freezing rivers. It was like dancing with death while holding on to the last breath. So Molly Ockett's life began around 1740 and between the devastating fourth and fifth Anglo-Wabanaki Wars. In 1724, midway through the fourth war, English bounty hunting mercenaries slaughtered and scalped Wabanaki men, women, and children at the Kennebec uh, Abenaki village at Norwich Walk. Those of you who were here last month heard John Bear tell about this uh, horrific massacre. After that, they raided Pequawket, the fortified head village of Maliakit's people. And that um, of Maliakit's people in the Saco River area, that, that's at the present day site of Freiburg. This attack forced her parents and other survivors to abandon their ancient fishing stations and cornfields to seek refuge in an Indian mission uh, up in the St. Lawrence River Valley. After the war, they returned seasonally to the Saco River and its tributaries for hunting and trapping and fishing. And that's where Molly was born. Her parents gave her an Abenaki name. We don't know what it was, but it was soon replaced by her French baptismal name, which was Marie Agatha. And on the tongues of her people, that became Molly Ockett. She was about four years old when the fifth Anglo-Wabanaki War began in 1744. Um, hoping to avoid more, more violence, her band paddled downstream to an English trading post where they represented themselves to authorities and claimed neutrality. The English response to that was to force Molly's father and fellow Pigwocket warriors to become scouts. Then they corralled the rest of the band and transported them to the outskirts of an English settlement south of Boston. When that fifth war ended in 1748, Molly's people petitioned to return home. It took a year, but when it happened, Molly was kept behind as a hostage. Authorities sent her to Boston to live as a servant girl with a Dutch, with a Protestant judge and his family. Eight months later, later, when she was finally allowed to leave, Molly was 10 years old. She was taken to Fort Richmond, just upriver from here. There, the English ship captain delivered her to Wabanaki hunters who agreed that they would take her to her parents. Here's a little passage about that. Although she had spent more than half of her young life among the English, becoming nearly as familiar with their customs as with her own, she soon realized that she had come back to her true home. During the next half decade, as she emer emerged into womanhood, she and her people enjoyed a welcome break from the perils of war. They spent much of the year inland along the Androscoggin River, a relatively safe distance from the pressures of English settlers pushing ever deeper into Wabanaki territory. The area, the first river valley immediately east of Saco River, offered ample fish and game, and for a brief time, the old ways flourished. Quickly, Maliakit learned the land, its wildlife, and its plants, and their healing secrets. Following age-old tradition, her family still passed the summer months at the coast. On one of many fingers of land jutting into the sea, they built their wigwams in open spaces between towering pines. Often, from a rock-strewn beach near the campsite, Molly would ease a bark canoe into the water, 
and paddle her way to an offshore island to gather bird eggs or comb the glistening mudflats for clams and clusters of bluish black mussels. These jaunts always enlivened her, for she felt completely free as she stroked her way across the big water. Here, in contrast to inland life on the river, nature presented itself on a grand scale. While the river's densely forested flanks revealed only a ribbon of sky, the Great Bay shouldered a vast blueness. The river harbored muskrats and beavers, but here seals and porpoises outweighing humans swam the waters. Just beyond the bay, in the distance, she often spotted whales that looked to be the size of islands blowing great puffs of water into the high, high into the air. Warmed by sunlight and cooled by moist wind scented with salt and seaweed, Molly Ocket dipped and pulled her paddle through the water. With the swish of each stroke and the slap of her canoe against the swells, she called up a rhythm that spoke to her of grandmothers and all lost ancestors. Then, in 1763, after the Sixth Anglo Wabanaki War, the French and English crowns signed the Treaty of Paris, in which the French surrendered political claims in North America. With the stroke of the pen, Wabanakis lost their French military allies and could no longer fight off English invaders who were stealing their lands and resources. They continued paddling um, and portaging to their, their, to their familiar and that, I'm sorry, they continued to paddle and port portage to their um, their old familiar sites, the ones that they still had access to. They picked up whatever remnants they could of their traditional lives, and they pieced together an existence. Most of them camped seasonally on the margins of new white towns. They erected their birch bark wigwams within walking distance of the new settlers. Then they got to work preparing items for trade. Here's how it was for Molly Ockett specifically. Molly Ockett's self-assured personality, along with practical skills and the cultural insights she'd gained while excised in, exiled in Boston as a girl, won her a relatively secure place on the margins of the white community. Camping for months at a time near Freiburg and other new towns in the region, she offered various services in exchange for food and assorted necessities. She fashioned sturdy baskets and birch bark containers that settlers needed for storage and harvest. She hunted ducks and from the pluckings made feather beds. She did fine moose hair embroidery, such as the purse pictured here, and gathered wild fruits and nuts for food. Most important of all, she collected medicinal plants. Unlike pioneers who were new to the region, Molly Ockett knew the healing properties of roots, barks, berries, and herbs growing in Wabanaki country, and she knew how to transform them into effective potions, sal salves, and poultices. Frontier folks who were reluctant to entrust themselves to an Indian often found that Molly Ockett was their only source of hope. They may have missed the irony of this, but Molly did not. The individuals asking her to cure them were related to the very people who had earned bounties for killing and scalping her relatives and friends. The descendants of those who brought epidemics to her people now asked her to heal them of diseases. How should she, who had lost so much, respond to a call for help from those who had done the taking? Focused on survival, Molly Ockett had little space for contemplating the dilemma of revenge versus forgiveness. She was a pragmatist. She understood that doctoring provided a means of supporting herself and her daughter. Yet there were times when human suffering worked on her heart and she could not help seeing the common humanity even with those who had attacked her people. Grace overcame her in those moments as it did when she attended and cured the wife of John Evans, a former scalp hunter. Sometimes when Molly placed her hand on patient's brows to measure a fever, she tried to read their minds with her fingertips. 
she sensed their anxiety. As in her own community of survivors, the labor of every family member was vital in hard scrabble pioneer life. These whites were not a lazy lot, thought Molly, but they were amazingly self-centered. They pursued their own liberty while trampling her heritage and freedom, as well as that of every other Wabanaki. To weather their presence, Molly Ockett knew she had to be shrewd and self-assured. She held on tightly to these qualities, determined that she would not be a small bead on someone else's dress. And so Molly Ockett continued through the American Revolution and beyond, growing old, tending to the needs of others. Her story ends like this. In 1816, when she was nearly 80, Molly Ockett fell ill while camping with Wabanaki Chief Metallic and his small band at Beaver Brook, 20 miles north of Andover. Knowing that she had doctored and traded with folks in East Andover, Metallic brought her there, hoping that the people she had helped would now help her. The town contracted Captain Thomas Bragg to look after her for a fee. When Molly said she wished to meet death in a camp of sweet smelling cedar, Brad Bragg built a wigwam for her near his house and each day stopped, it, stopped by to check on her, give her a meal and rekindle her fire. The time between his visits passed slowly. Living with loneliness day after day, she came to understand it and realized that it was the dark space between two worlds. It held the shadows of familiar things that had been taken from her and alien things she had chosen to refuse. This was not how it was meant to have been. In the past, one's relatives were not scattered. An old woman's children and grandchildren brought food and firewood to her wigwam, and she told them old stories at whatever pace she pleased. But now, after a few lonely months in a white man's backyard, Maliakit died. One thing I find remarkable about um, her passing was that she was self-sufficient until the very end. Her few, main, few remaining possessions, they were all auctioned out, off, and those were used to pay Captain Bragg and to cover the cost of her burial. So she paid her way till the end. I don't know if she had dogs, but I love this picture. <laughs> And now we come to the third Molly, Molly Molasses. She lived from 1775 till 1867. This Molly's life is metaphorically linked to the moon of blinding snow. Her chapter begins like this. Just to stay alive was an achievement during winters in Wabanaki country. Temperatures plunged far below freezing and downpours of snow shrouded the landscape and hampered mobility. Some creatures burrowed in for the season, others retreated to warmer climes. Those who faced the weather head on risked much. Often after the snow fell and settled, cold wild wind whipped it back into a blizzard. During the moon of blinding snow, most storms had more than one life. As Molly Molasses told, her, told it, her mother gave birth to her in a canoe. She's the one. It was a fitting place for a child whose family moved around, camping mostly along the Penobscot between Bangor and their head village at Indian Island Old Town, but also along smaller watercourses between there and the coast. She was baptized Mary Pelagy, which Penobscots turned into Molly Balassi, and which later became Molly Molasses. She grew up well versed in the old ways of her people. But in the course of her lifetime, they lost nearly all the land on which their traditional life ways depended. In 1776, when she was just a baby, Chief Joseph Orono protested that settlers were taking over Penobscot territory and cheating in trade. 
He signed a pact to have his warriors help American rebels in their war against old England in exchange for fair dealing and a promise to stop the land theft. It didn't work. In 1786, three years after the American Revolution ended, the new government of the state of Massachusetts, which included Maine, pressed the tribe to relinquish all but 200,000 acres of their ancestral domain. For years, Orono and his tribal council refused to sign the proposed and untranslated treaty, but ultimately crippled by unstoppable encroachments and hoping for at least a measure of security, the Penobscot signed two successive treaties, forfeiting their claims on several million acres. By the early 1830s, the reservation had been reduced to a mere 5,000 acres. It was now comprised of 140 small islands, including their head village at Indian Island Old Town, all linked by and held within the 30 mile stretch of their river from the Old Town floors, Falls north to the, to the Forks. As the century marched on, Bangor emerged as the lumber capital of the world, cleared of trees and crowded with 20,000 inhabitants from a foreign land. Brick buildings rather than hefty white pines now linked earth to sky, and screaming sawmills eclipsed the sounds of the river. Like other Penobscots, Molly struggled to survive within this radically changing society. A, uh, a society that pushed her proud people to the margins and sometimes just shoved them over the edge. She turned to trade as a livelihood and she became a very shrewd dealer, selling and bartering native crafts. She was considered one of the strongest Penobscot women of all time, that's still true today. And she had influence in tribal matters and she often intimidated white folks. She was known as a Mitalan, a shaman among her own people. And among the whites, they referred to her as a witch. She never married, but she was a longtime comrade of the famous Penobscot chief, John Neptune, pictured there to the left. Um, and with him, she was, said, she was said to have had four, I mean, he was said to have fathered her four children. That's one of their children, their daughter, Sarah, in the middle. I, I think we're going to be running short of time. I'm going to jump forward and read two passages that catch Molly Molasses um, late in her life when she's reflecting upon the upheaval and loss. In 1865, Molly Molasses was 90 years old and bitter to the bone. Most folks in Bangor stepped aside when she passed, looking down to avoid her hard gaze. Others, mesmerized by her keen dark eyes, paused long enough to drop a coin into her outstretched hand. Some gave because they pitied her, especially during Maine's merciless winters when she clutched a worn woolen blanket around the slope of her shoulders. Many gave out of fear, for they had heard that this old Penobscot Indian woman was a witch. Better keep her happy, they whispered to each other, or she'll use her magic against us. Molly Molasses, fanned um, their anxiety with her volatile temper, convinced that their uneasiness propped up her pride and increased the success of her begging. To those who gave silver instead of copper, she offered a photograph of herself, the one in the upper left corner there. She liked the picture of the stern, proud woman wearing the traditional peaked headdress of her people. Along with the photo, she handed out a poem written for her by a local bard. The ode ended with this stanza. I write these rhymes, poor mall, for you to sell. Go, sell them quick to any saint or sinner. Not to save one sell, soul from heaven or hell, but just to buy your weary form a dinner. In the last years of her life, Molly, Molly Molasses wandered like an aimless ghost through a land she no longer recognized more white folks than trees, she thought grimly. On a gray winter morning, she walked to the water's edge 
and stood on the wharf watching the river leave itself. In the moon of blinding snow, continents of clouds covered the sky and the stream on the verge of freezing flowed dull and dark. Her eyes moved across the current to the far shore where crows hung in the naked branches of surviving trees. All at once, they lifted themselves skyward and as they disappeared into the storm, Molly thought she heard someone whisper her name in the beating of wings. And now we come to the fourth and last Molly of the night, uh, Mary, Mary Alice Nelson, who lived from 1904 to 1977. And suddenly we will have an array of photographs because they are available. Uh, her people called her Molly Dallas or Molly Dell, but her stage name was Molly Spotted Elk. Her life is tied to spring, the sewing moon. It begins with this epigraph. With the coming of spring, the hard backs of Wabanaki rivers cracked and their crystal cries stirred a sleeping world. The ice broke open and streams flowed freely. Trees grew hazy green halos. Birds winged back to sing their eternal songs and seeds Autumn's false corpses prepared to sprout anew and tell the story of life yet again. This was the sowing moon. Molly Dell grew up on Indian Island when there was still no bridge connecting it to the mainland. Everyone crossed over by canoe or by the uh, tribe's hand road ferry, or in wintertime, they walked across a sawdust trail on the ice. Molly came into the world at a time when most members of dominant white society viewed Indians as backward, racially inferior, county fair material. Since the latter 1800s, tourists had visited the island out of curiosity. This is the, uh, the landing at Indian Island with Old Town right across the, the water there. Um, recognizing economic opportunity, Penobscots who made crafts or did music were often on hand to greet them. Youngsters who hoped to earn a nickel want volunteered to dance. Penobscots also staged grand pageants. These were for their own pleasure, but also to promote their wares. Um, Molly Dell's sister, who's pictured there with Molly holding the paddles, uh, one time in one of my interviews with her, her name was Apid, she said, when this picture of Molly Dell and me was taken, there was a pageant on the reservation with dancing, big chow, and all kinds of races. Molly and I won the canoe race. Molly was the oldest of eight children, so she was expected to help support her siblings. From her early teens, she ventured out to market her Indianness around New England. She often faced heckling crowds. As a 15-year-old, she told her diary, who was her dearest friend her whole life, cried after performance. Why? Heard a cutting remark about Indians. But sometimes she fought back, as evidenced in this journal entry. A front row couple made fun of us. I flirted with the fellow, and the girl became silent. In another instance, she challenged an audience's insults by writing what she called a criticism on racial feeling to the Boston Telegram. With each passing year, you can see just the, the beauty and presence that she had. Um, Molly's talent and beauty and determination afforded her an ever wider range of experience, from vaudeville and Wild West shows to work as an Indian counselor at Camp Overlook, this elite summer camp, by the way, is in, was in Georgetown. I don't think it's still there, is it? Does anybody know? Um, in Georgetown. And they hired her to teach Indian lore, dance, and canoeing. By her mid-20s, she had taken the name Molly Spotted Elk and was a well-known performer in New York City, especially at, a, at the famous Texas Guinan nightclub. Texas Guinan is the woman who, maybe you've heard of her, there's been films about her. She used to greet her, the audiences at her nightclub with the saying, hello, suckers. And then she charged them up the wazoo for every drink they had. 
Um, there, Molly was discovered by a wealthy explorer filmmaker who cast her in the lead in the, the film The Silent Enemy. This movie, now a classic one, was filmed on location with an all native cast in northern Ontario. It, um, the, all of the um, wigwams and the canoes and all of the clothing that people wore were made by traditionalists who still knew how to do that. And it took a year on site just to create the material culture to go with the story. Um, Molly's ability to handle a canoe and brave the rigors of filming outdoors um, during winter scenes really clinched her role in the film. That's her paddling in the canoe. Uh, in 1931, Molly danced before royalty and heads of state as the opening act in the 1931 Colonial Exposition in Paris. She also performed daily in front of the, um, with the US Indian Band in front of the American Pavilion, which you may recognize as a replica of George Washington's home in Mount Vernon. She really discovered very quickly that French audiences were quite different from American audiences. Um, she felt they were more sophisticated. She felt they appreciated the kinds of serious dance that she loved to do. In particular, she loved to do what she called the lecture dance. Um, where she would tell about it, tell about a dance, and then perform it. Um, she enjoyed it so much that she decided to stay in France after the expo ended. She modeled for various artists, like this. This is a painting by Paul Coase, um, and also she advised anthropologists at Northeast Indian displays at the Musée de l'Homme, and she danced in an array of venues throughout Paris and well beyond in in other places in Europe. She also fell into a very deep love affair with Jeanne Chambaud, a Parisoir um, journalist who came to interview her for a story and then just wanted to interview her continually. Um, together, they trekked the Pyrenees. I love this picture because she's the one carrying the gear. Um, and they co-wrote articles about camping and Native American traditions and Remarkably to me, they researched the story of another French Indian couple, Molly Matilda and, the, and Saint Castin. Sometimes Jean accompanied Molly on the drums for special lecture dance performance. Often he would dress as an Indian to do so. Most significantly, he urged her to finish her manuscript of the Penobscot legends she had gathered from elders when she was a child. She would exchange um, doing house chores for a story in her growing up years. And then he helped her to find a publisher. In 1934, they had a child together. She was named Jean after her father, Jean. Four years later, they married, but they were forced to separate because of World War II. When German troops marched into France, Jean went into hiding and Molly, made a heroic journey on foot with their little girl over the Pyrenees Mountains into Spain. Her book of legends, about to go to press, became a victim of the war. Ultimately, she and little Jean made it home to Indian Island, and Jean reached the safety of a refugee camp in unoccupied Southern France. However, he died before he could reunite with them. In the wake of that loss and the horrors they'd experienced of the war, Molly suffered a breakdown, a mental breakdown so severe that her mother had her institutionalized. Here's an excerpt from that part of her story. In the confines of the institution, days slowly turned into weeks, weeks into months. Molly passed much the time writing. She made detailed notes about imagined conspiracies against her and composed long, bitter letters that rarely made it into the mailbox. She also wrote in her diary, reflecting on her situation with an astuteness that would have surprised her doctor. She analyzed her physical and mental health, described other patients and various doctors and nurses, 
complained that she wasn't getting the attention she needed and made careful and loving note of anyone who came to visit her. For as long as Molly Dallas could remember, she had kept diaries. In the past, they had been her solace and her centering point, the place where she affirmed what was dear to her, family, nature, career, and the age-old traditions of her people. Through the years, her diaries had kept her grounded in the face of a multitude of fears, from the fear of rejection and racial insults to that of personal failure and the loss of her culture. Molly sensed that whatever sanity she still had came from keeping her journal, so she turned to it daily as if she could write her way to peace of mind. And then, quite suddenly, she was released and went home to Indian Island. In the years that followed, she spent her days quietly reading and writing, making Indian dolls and baskets, tending the garden. She took long forest walks and she cared for her grandchildren when they visited. And she also went to John Bear's school and he can tell you about that a little bit afterwards if you'd like and spoke to the kids. This final excerpt comes from that late part of her life. On a March day in 1969, just before winter gave way to spring, Molly climbed into her boots, wrapped herself in a long coat and shawl, and turned down the forest path that led to the river. Reaching the water's edge, she snapped several boughs from an evergreen and made a seat for herself atop the snowy bank. Sitting there, back propped against the sturdy trunk, she randomly opened her 1929 diary. Her eyes fell upon an entry made 40 years earlier when she was just 25. The beautiful things live on and heal the wounds of sorrow. Closing her eyes, Molly held to this precious thought, and like the river on a hot summer day, it beckoned her. She dove in and it embraced her. Then she drank it in and swallowed its joy. So the beautiful parts of Molly Dell's life do indeed live on. Um, there's evidence all around. And I think, again, if we have time for questions, that's something John Bear can also address. Although she gained international fame as a dancer, as a performing artist, her most lasting legacy may well be her writing. In particular, those legends she collected from the elders, those ancient stories that explained how rivers and the rest of the natural world came to be, those legends that became the victim of World War II when her publisher dropped the idea? Well, in 2003, the Maine Folklife Center at University of Maine, Orono, published them 25 years after Molly's passing. And now John Bear and other Wabanaki can share these stories. Thank you. When you were researching the, the first Molly, mm -hmm. one from the 17th century, were you able to find very much information about um, the, the role of women um, versus men and, and how they were treated? Yes, I mean, there was information about men and women and how, how each was treated, how they treated each other, what the traditions were. And some of those came from early explorers and from the, you know, from the priests, um, the missionaries. Um, in terms of the specifics about Molly Matilda, that became that was a much greater challenge because there was a fair amount written down um, about her husband um, and some about Mataquando, but almost nothing was written about women. So I describe in the book how I had to hand, how I handled that, and really what it was, I, I gathered all the information that surrounded her about the life ways, about women, about men, um, and then the specifics about Saint Castin and Mataquando. And then when I had something like a silhouette of her, I began to paint inside and. Um, imagine. Um, the other thing is, of course, I talked with the Native community, Molly's, um, um, Molly Spotterduck's daughter, and many other women in particular on the reservation, and just got a feel for how they talked about things, how they thought about things, and that was enormously helpful. 
Anybody else? How did you uh, how did you learn those languages to read? How did you learn the language to read the notes and writing of these women? Oh well, the um, the there were I, the only notes in writing of the women that I had were Molly Spotted Elk that were actually by one of the women, um, and so she spoke English. Um, she knew something of her traditional language, but when she was growing up, the value was, I mean, parents on the reservation really wanted their kids to know English and to survive in the wider world. And so there was an emphasis on that. Uh, so anyway, Molly's diaries, um, her letters, all of her correspondence, research notes, things like that were, were all in English. So that wasn't a problem. And there was um, there was a lot of anecdotal and then some serious um, notations made about Molly Ockett um, from by the community by a guy named Nathaniel True. So there's a there was a lot of going to archives and befriending archivists and um, you know trying to have them be patient while I said, couldn't we look one more place for something like this kind of thing? Yeah. Are we done here, I think? Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you being here. And a special thank you to John Bear. Um, yeah, John Bear, can you come here? So because um, we are real collaborators, John Bear switched the sequence of our, of our beginning. And I was going to introduce him. And oh, you have, to come, you have to come over here. I was going to introduce him and you go this way and say um, a little bit about him. You heard when he gave his talk, um, people who were here heard about him, but his, his work center is the Wabanaki Center at the University of Maine, Orono, where he coordinates the um, native student program for all of the University of Maine system, but also, and also teaches um, uh, Wabanaki history. Um, so in addition to drumming and singing and um, writing songs and acting and a host of other things and being a single grandparent to his granddaughter. Um, he, he just does a host of things. And I met him many, many years ago and also knew and was very fond of his grandfather, who one day, I'm going to tell this story, <laughs> I went to see him and he said, I just got a new pacemaker. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, do you want to see it? And I said, yeah. So he goes like this. And he said, do you want to touch it? And I said, yeah. So I did. And then he said to me, you know what my granddaughter calls my pacemaker? And I said, no. And he said, a peacemaker. And so he really liked that. And I loved that as well. And that's what John is. This, that's what this guy is. Um, just an ever ready collaborator and giver and um, yeah, not a prejudiced bone in the body. It's kind of wonderful. I have a present for him. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Can so I eat it? You can't eat it. Oh. You may, you, by, by the shape of it, you may be able to guess what it is. So my husband, my Dutch husband who's standing over there, he and I have had um, one of our 15 um, nieces and nephews visiting us. Um, this is a nephew with his two kids. And they've been exploring our land, which is just up river from here. We've got nine acres, a nine acre peninsula. And um, the little boy who just had his 12th birthday, when he was out walking our land, um, he found something very special. And he was so excited to take it home to the Netherlands. And my husband told him, the boy's name is Mats. Um, my husband said, I'm sorry, but you're not allowed to take an eagle feather out of the country. And it's a sacred feather. And the people who are allowed to have these feathers are the American Indian community who live here. So Mott's wanted to give it to you, but he's down watching the Red Sox tonight. <laughs> so I'm giving this to you on behalf of Mott's. It's a beauty. Well, I mean, you can't get any more perfect than that. That's poor Eagle is flying in a circle now. <laughs> uh, but a little off balance but uh thank you so much like, i really appreciate it like, 
I remember my um, when Bunny was coming up to do the interview, my grandfather said, you know, I want you to come be there with her with me, because sometimes he was older at the time he retired at the age of 79 in the year 1999 and died 10 years later in 2009. But he was always afraid he was going to screw something up or forget something. And this was a man that <clears throat> was incredibly um, knowledgeable in higher ed and had been the high, the longest serving indigenous person in any higher ed institution in the history of the United States and Canada at the time. I'm going to beat him, but um, <laughs> I've been there. 20 years, so I, I play. He was he was there for quite a while, but um, but anyway, he said, you know, she's got a gift, and you listen to her, you work with her if you need to, and um, it was it was better than that. I took the book, um, Women of the Dawn, and I I was on the board of the Abbey Museum on Bar Harbor, and I said we need to make a curriculum out of this, and we did, and um, you know, it's online. I don't know if she proved of it or not, but um, we did. And, but anyway, we broke it all down. Um, and I couldn't appreciate Harold and, and Bunny um, and my, a good friend of mine too, Michael Pauling, who really have their hearts for us. And um, until we can start doing the work ourselves collaboratively, we use the best that we have right now. And that's what's standing here. So um, I want to thank you. So thanks for coming to our love yes. fest. We, and, we really appreciate it. I'm, and I, I feel bad he can't take this home, but he would never get it home. Um, he would, he would with a fine. Maybe his dad would get a fine, but and then the eagle feather would go to Colorado. And I think it should stay here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Harold. Yeah. Thanks. And the thank you fest continues. Thank you to our audience, both here and away. Um, thank you for joining us. And thank you to Bunny for introducing us to the four Mollies. And we have a gift for you as well. And it is a Sam Manning print with a water bottle. And she's like, yes, OK. So um, thank you. Goodbye to all of our audience online. Um, and you all are welcome to stay and mingle. And thanks so much.